So, we're like well over a month overdue for a new episode. Honestly, it was kind of hard to produce what with all the insanity that eventually went down here. And I do mean that past tense, a whole bunch of this shit already went down. My role now is to tell you what it was. So, the Ultra Thinker turned out to be some kind of gorilla. Yeah, didn't see that one coming. Anyway, he had a kind of a sob story to tell. I was a test animal at MIT in the 1960s. My intelligence was artificially heightened by experiments with electro-video interface. But, to the surprise of my human masters, I did not simply interact with the programs, I improved them. My simian brain pushing video technology to realms never considered by mere humans. Uh-huh. So unfortunately, the MIT guys didn't really recognize what was happening with their monkey, and he got licensed off to NASA to be the, uh, pilot for a deep space probe. Blasted into the depths of space, he was bombarded by cosmic radiation, causing him to evolve into the heightened state of a trans-dimensional super-being. Like Simeon from Dial M for Monkey. Ah, yes, like Simeon in Dial M for Monkey. Anyway, now calling himself Ultra Thinker, he projected his consciousness back to Earth, hoping to see that the video technology he'd helped unlock evolved on similar lines to himself. Instead, he found... Toys! Ridiculous, meaningless toys! Starting with the MIT guy's space war, electro-video input had evolved into video games, bringing joy to millions but only disdain to the Ultra Thinker, who had believed himself evolved beyond the capacity for mere fun. And while the binding spell cast by the mages over Wario's woods prevented transdimensional beings from directly entering our world, his mental powers allowed him to exert influence all the same. Turns out it was the Ultra Thinker who bent the minds of the developers of E.T. to crash the console market in 1983. It was he who manipulated the markets to nudge the Dreamcast towards collapse, crippling Sega. It was he who funneled money and influence to censors and politicians, merely dooming games for good in the 90s. Basically everything bad that happened in gaming over the last three decades or so, that was all the Ultra Thinker. But with the emergence of the internet came the emergence of a seemingly unified gamer culture, one that was finally too strong to be swayed by his subtle machinations. But the Ultra Thinker found a different path. It seemed the only power that could destroy gamers were gamers themselves. So I changed my strategy. I would use my influence to change gaming itself, crippling old stalwarts and giving rise to a new dark age of gaming. A new breed of games and of gamers, both driven not by the old magics of wonder, imagination, and the thrill of discovery, but by the modern engines of hatred and aggression, of a lust for blood and warfare, and PepsiCo products. Step by diabolical step, I engineered the corruption and degradation of video games. The holy temples of the arcade spell, replaced by the festering cesspits of the fraternity and Xbox Live. Gaming would become diseased and hateful, intolerant of outsiders and allergic to progress, and would at last destroy itself. But one mere mortal stood in my way. The Game Overthinker, champion of justice and freedom, the one hero who could lead gaming back from the brink and toward a new golden age. He's also so humble. That's what I like about him. Literally everything crazy that's happened to the Overthinker and myself, beginning with the first appearance of the Anti-Thinker, Yo! has all been Ultra Thinkers doing, up to and including the rise of the Oolong Tea Party. And now, he appears to have at last abducted the Overthinker himself, leaving us to fend for ourselves in the final days of this epic, if convoluted, war. Anyway, that's where we are now. Uh, we did also finally get this thing. Oh yeah, right, and Retrothinker went to the Tower of Mystery and procured the ultimate weapon of gaming, which we thought would be the Master Sword. But it is in fact the Golden Axe. Which game is that even from? Golden Axe. I know, but which game? Golden Axe. Right, I can see that, but which game? Golden Axe. I can see that it's a Golden Axe. What is the game that it is from? Golden Axe. Yes, but which game? Oh, good lord. Golden Axe. What game did you get it from? Golden Axe. What game? Golden Axe. I don't see what's so difficult about this. What game? Golden Axe. I can see that it's a Golden Axe. Which game is it from? 
Golden axe. Guys, enough. All right. So we've got the weapon. We know who and where our enemies are. We may even have the element of surprise on our side. What do we do now? Uh... Um... Uh... I don't know. Mark some time to stretch the series out to an even 100 episodes? Mark time to stretch the series out to an even 100 episodes. So here's what I don't get. Are you sure we have time for the whole list? Fuck off. What I don't get is the Ultra Thinker says he's supposedly, like, taken all the joy and wonderment out of gaming, right? Well, as far as I can see, there was already problems in it far back as you could see. I mean, there was always cash-ins and rip-offs and sequels and mindless filler. This golden age you guys talk about, I don't think it was a real thing. And if it was, it can't possibly be as good as you says it was. Yes, it was. Yes. Okay. Could you perhaps illustrate that with a point? You know, so we could, like, make a fucking show? Well, I... Shit, I don't think Super Mario Bros. 2 could happen today, just for one example. Explain. Just imagine. You got yourself a game, and it's not just any game, it's THE game. The biggest game on the planet since the moment it came out. An epic-defining, direction-changing, history-of-the-medium reshaping, gargantuan, instant classic. Its main character is already the biggest name in the history of gaming. Its peripheral characters are household names. Its literal building blocks are now the cultural shorthand for the near entirety of the industry. If someone owns the console your game appears on, chances are they got it for your game. And now it's time to release the sequel. The smart money says you should just make the first game again, but change up the level design and add some graphical tweaks and new bells and whistles in the mechanics. That's what most game sequels do, and did and had done up to that point. After all, if you ask customers what they wanted out of a sequel, they'd have surely told you that more of the same would be just fine. And you could even reuse the art and programming assets. And it's not like the industry is in a safe place, either. Your install base is hardly bulletproof, the consumer economy is ever uncertain, and an expensive flop could be a major blow. You should play it safe. Do the easy thing. Go for the guaranteed hit. Maybe they're not going to love it like the last one, but they'll probably like it just fine. Or maybe you don't do that. Maybe you decide to aim higher. Do something fresh, challenging, and completely different. New gameplay, more diverse character roster, a completely new setting, a whole new look, a brand new, thrice as large cast of enemies, a newer, bigger, more expansive world, a new story. Maybe, maybe, you elect to roll the dice, aim high, and use the goodwill you've built, the love people have for the characters and the trust they have in the brand, to get them to try a new experience. Something different, something that can expand not only their horizons, but the horizons of gaming itself. Now, to be fair, there are some mitigating circumstances involved here. Nintendo did make a more conventional sequel for Japan, and mainly wanted to release something different worldwide because by that point it would have looked slightly behind the curve and there were concerns about the difficulty level, since the game had essentially been designed as a hard mode version of the first one. And it's not like they dreamed up all the new stuff out of nowhere, they reskinned an entirely separate game. Everyone knows that. On the other hand, Shigeru Miyamoto was actually much more involved in the creation of Doki Doki Panic than he was in the Japanese Super Mario sequel, and it's not like they couldn't have found another platformer more in keeping with Super Mario Bros. tradition to reskin instead, they chose to pick a game whose template allowed Mario and company to expand their skill sets from stomping to brawling. Enemies with nothing in common with Bowser's minions, Luigi to emerge as a visually distinct character, and Princess Peach to rise from victim to heroine. So, uh, basically, yeah, I'm calling it a wash. I'll buy that. It may not seem the part now, but I firmly believe that Super Mario Bros. 2 coming out like it did, when it did, worldwide, was one of the most important game-changing moments in the history of modern games. For the first time, a major series had gambled that a character, a mere stack of colored pixels broadly reinterpreted into a cartoon box art drawing, had stronger appeal than the promise of an identical experience. On paper, or whatever they used to plot out game design back in the day, Super Mario Bros. 2 had about as much in common with its predecessor as Halo does with Bubble Bobble. But Nintendo was betting that didn't matter, so 
long as they could promise Mario and Mario could promise a good game. Think of where we might be without this game in terms of video game history. Would Princess Peach ever have become a character more meaningful than Fairy Tale World Pauline? Would Luigi have ever emerged as a character distinct from Palette Swapped Mario? Would Toad or the Mushroom People in general have become important at all? Would gameplay shakeups like the power up suits in Super Mario Bros. 3 or Yoshi in Super Mario World had ever been considered necessary? Would JFK have even been shot? Would the Nazis have annexed the Sudeten Lent? Would Joe Theismann have survived his career ending football injury? Would Taker and Sting have wrestled in their prime? Would Penny Arcade have still continued to alienate legions of female fans, all for the sake of a single obnoxious- Are you finished? Yeah, I'm good. If no one had ever found out that gamers would follow Mario into the dream world of Subcon, if the series had forever remained just about breaking bricks in the Mushroom Kingdom, would Nintendo have ever sent him to Dinosaur Land, or Sarasa Land, or to ride go-karts, play golf, tennis, basketball, football, baseball, board games, star in an RPG, manage a hotel? <sighs> they can't all be winners, folks. But what's the point? The point is, can you imagine any of that happening today? A modern franchise taking that level of risk? A modern developer deciding to go that far outside the box? A modern audience being receptive to it? A modern gaming press welcome it instead of dumping cynical skepticism all over it? No. The point is, we're in a rut. Everything is too big to fail, but also too big to innovate. So we spin our wheels, not going anywhere special and in no hurry to get there. <sighs> We are abandoned. At least you won't have to wait much longer. Lieberson. Oh, come now. Why stand on formalities, retro thinker? It's time you knew my real name and saw my true face. Wait a minute. Are we really doing this? He's not an actual ninja. Seriously, we're doing two unmasking endings in a row? He's not even Asian. He's... he's... Dr. Beardo? Beardo?